visitors here today <laughs> so I just got to let you know I'm not the pastor pastor Isaac and a bunch of our men are gone to the uh, men's conference and uh, so I'm filling in and uh, I'm an elder here I'm a retired biology teacher who has the passion to teach creation science to give another view of life on earth besides the evolutionary view and that's part of what we're going to do, to do today. <laughs> and <clears throat> it's kind of unusual to come into a church and hear about dinosaurs. <laughs> but really, we should be able to use the Bible to explain anything. And, it's, and the, the neat thing is we can. <laughs> just got to be trained in doing it sometimes. But before I start into the presentation, I just want to tell everybody that as soon as I retired from teaching biology, I wrote a paper that has the seven ways that evolution defies observational science. We're told that the creationists are the ones who believe in fairy tales and don't have anything to back up what they believe. Uh, as with most of Satan's deceptions, just the opposite is true. We actually have a lot more observational science that verifies our worldview than the evolutionists do. And I've written up seven of those on this paper. Um, and I've got a bunch of websites on the back of ministries you can go to, and most of those have search engines that you can type in a question that you might have from a grandchild or a, a peer uh, that where they want to know a, something about creation science and you can't answer it, so you just type it in that search box, DVD clips, magazine, and book articles, uh, chapters out of books will come up where you can read about it, and, and witness to that person. So I want to equip you. Part of what I want to do today is equip the church to uh, just have a little bit of basic knowledge about this because uh, it's important. We're in a culture that's inundated with that evolutionary view. And probably one of the most uh, pervasive things is what we're taught about dinosaurs, and one of the earliest ways we've learned about millions or billions of years is through well, we learned about dinosaurs. So I want to talk about that today. I also want to mention that uh, on Monday nights, we have a class every, every, every Monday. <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, usually 10 to 15 people are here, but we, uh, we have a different topic every Monday that we talk about creation science and kind of build up, you know, uh, the more you come, the, mo the more you expand your knowledge of it. It's at 6.30 tomorrow. My, my uh, talk tomorrow is going to be Deception, Satan's Favorite Tool, or subtitle, Can You Really Believe Your Eyes? If you like optical illusions, I have a lot of optical illusions in this one because you really can't believe your eyes. <laughs> and Satan knows that, and he knows how to fool us, even in that regard. So anyway, if you're interested in that, you can come tomorrow at 6.30. There's also, uh, we, we have DVDs here and at God 411 and at the Church on the Street House. Lots of creation science, DVDs, books, magazines, stuff like that. You can go to those places and just check it out, uh, you know, when you want to. Those are materials that are available that uh, me and other people uh, have made available so, so that you can... If you, if you realize the impact of this on our culture and you want to get more involved in being a light in the dark area, of, of this dark area, you can equip yourself to do that. And on, the, on this paper, you have my uh, cell phone number and my email address. 
and I'll be glad to assist you in any way I can. So uh, with that said, I can now go into my presentation. So this is a biblical view. I'm just taking what we have out there to look at, and I, and I researched it, and I put a lot of stuff on here. My presentations are real visual because I would love to have the young people in to see it. And uh, so hopefully that keeps them uh, engaged. I'm going to start off with a little bit of scripture, though, to tell you why my philosophy in doing this. So in Romans, we learn that as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall, shall, <clears throat> shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. I don't want to stand before God at that day and find out that man's ideas were wrong and I had contradicted scripture in my teaching and have to give an account for that before God. My works would be burned and I would still be going to heaven, but as the Bible says, it would be like I have smoking clothes because I didn't get there very, very well. And so I want my works to stand. I, want, I don't want to teach anything that's non-scriptural. That's my full intent as I'm teaching this topic. Jesus said, if you believe Moses, he gave us Genesis, right? Moses gave us Genesis. You would believe me, for he wrote about me. Whoa. Yes, Genesis has the first messianic prophecy in 315. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So Jesus says, if you don't believe Moses, if you're not, if you're not going to believe Genesis because the scientists have told you that it's not true, how are you going to believe what I'm saying? He's, Jesus told us it's all one thing. You know, you, you got to believe what God has put there for us. So... Um, that's what I intend to do for my own personal life. For the word of the Lord is right and all his work is done in truth. I really believe that or I wouldn't be here this morning. And teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I don't care how dumb the evolutionists think I am. Because they've been deceived. And they're going to think I'm dumb. I will praise you, O Lord, my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify your name forevermore. So I'm an unapologetic young earth creationist. I believe that's what the Bible teaches, and I'm not going to compromise and say, well, the scientists may be right in this area. No. Where, where the Bible talks about it, the Bible is right. So we're going to apply the Bible to our thinking in every area, and I'm really qualified to give this particular talk because, yeah, back in those days, yeah, we used to ride those things, round up the dinosaurs. But, uh, I've asked uh, the people in the sound booth to make sure that the camera is pointed at the TV because I've noticed on my other dinosaur presentations, which I think it's been seven years since I did it here, uh, it shows me for an hour with all these slides. So for those of you who are watching on Facebook, that's what I look like. I'm a little bit heavier now and a lot grayer, but that's kind of what I look like right there. And those dinosaurs are at the Creation Museum, which my wife and I both volunteered at when it was being built. I, I was there for nine weeks at various times, and she was there for six. And uh, so th those are just getting ready to get put out into the dinosaur hall a few weeks after we were there. There was almost open when we were Last time we were there when we were still volunteering. But dinosaurs capture our imagination. You know, in Arizona, up around Holbrook, you see dinosaurs on I-40. You see, you see them all over, and uh, people just love dinosaurs. <laughs> and scientists know that. That's why they present dinosaurs to kids. Well, in this slide, I like to call it the slide of three dinosaurs. But uh, the guy standing with me is Dr. Rick Oliver, and uh, he has a ministry called Confound the Wise Ministries. He lives in Tonto Basin. And uh, I traveled three and a half months in 2010 with him across the country to the Creation Museum in, in uh, Kentucky, all the way back to Mount St. Helens. But he gave me great confidence that what I'm teaching is true from even a secular scientific view 
that that he he said they don't have anything that can contradict this and and uh, he has a PhD in evolutionary biology he got that to prove his mom wrong about the Bible and now he goes across the country teaching about creation science so you can <laughs> see what he found out and his neat thing about his ministry is a kind of a one of a kind ministry he uses the secular journals he takes quotes out of them to disprove the evolutionist case from the secular journals which is awesome <laughs> so Christians are not the only fishers of men our television shows on TV our little books that my wife taught out of in first grade all teach millions and billions of years for dinosaurs so from a very early age we're indoctrinated into this way of thinking and without even realizing what's going on there okay but the children's shows are not the only thing that they go after adults too so this is an article dinosaurs take wings the origin of birds not all evolutionists believe this by the way but you'd think that they did by the literature that, that is out there but uh, boy, what a big leap it is to go from something as heavy and lumbering as a dinosaur to something that can fly like a bird. You've got to have a whole different respiratory, circulatory, uh, bone, everything's got to, how does that evolve? It can't, it's, uh, it's all a lie, but that, that's what the propaganda, that's propaganda <laughs> to get you to think in th that way. Well, Dennis the Menace asked an interesting question. I think some of the people here might have heard of Dennis the Menace before. I think he's still around in some places. But if people weren't around when dinosaurs were, then who drew their pictures? You know what? That's a good question, isn't it? That's, that's a deep question, Dennis. <laughs> well, there's actually an answer to that question. We drew their pictures by studying the, re the remains in the fossil record. Okay, so we have dinosaur footprints. That's the Polexi Riverbed near Glen Rose, Texas famous set of dinosaur tracks there. They have to keep it uh, covered water in there because otherwise the weather just kind of changes the footprint over time. So this rather famous footprint, and it says it was verified by a spiral CT scan, but the thing is, over time, the human-looking footprint that's underneath the dinosaur footprint has started looking a little bit more like a baby dinosaur's footprint. So we don't really use that anymore. That's one of the things that they said that we've kind of taken it off the table because what I'm going to show you later is a lot more convincing anyway and, it, and it's not changing, it's, you know, preserved. So uh, just, I, I wanted to mention that because many of us have heard of this before and uh, we're, we're not sure about those human footprints now so we, we're not going to usually mention that. So this guy is standing on a huge mountain of dinosaur bones in China. It's kind of like they were caught up in a big flood, disarticulated, and then dumped in this certain spot. <laughs> I wonder where that big flood came from. <laughs> well, we have a huge mountain of dinosaur bones at Dinosaur National Monument. There's places in South America and other places in the world where you can find marine, <laughs> land, and air animals all buried in the same area. Kind of like they were caught up in a big flood and, oh, okay. But, so the creationist worldview explained these things very well, whereas the evolutionary view of slow and gradual processes really can't do it. They say it was a local flood that did that. Yeah, I don't think so. So a stegosaurus backplate. So we find that, and we find the tail spikes, and then we find fossilized dinosaur skin, and then we find mummified dinosaur skin, not fossilized. That's lasted for 65 million years. Uh, well, that's kind of hard to believe in my book. So anyway, we find enough stuff that we finally we make some depictions of the dinosaurs. And I'm going to show you later on, I think we made some pretty good models. Because I think there's people who actually saw these and our models closely represent what they depicted. And so there's a stegosaurus, and it's really big in the Creation Museum, and uh, big and awesome and fearsome, and those tail spikes would, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but those little dinosaurs 
are more representative of the actual average size of the dinosaurs. We had some really big ones, and we had some not much bigger than a chicken. The average size is like a cow. Okay, so that's the average size. But boy, we glamorize those big ones, don't we? Well, so what, what do they do? They find the bones, and, and so I'm going to say this one's got a really long neck, so they found a bunch of neck vertebrae, and they made one with a long neck because they think that they had a lot of extra vertebrae in the neck, kind of like the giraffe of the dinosaur world. And then when you go into the museum, you see this. This, this is on the first thing you see as you're going in from the lobby. The dark-haired guy is the evolutionist. And over the sound system, you hear him talking about how he's interpreting the evidence, what he's looking at, from the slow and gradual processes of old Earth view. And then the other guy is a creation scientist, and he's interpreting it from a worldwide flood view, a young Earth view. And when you look at that, you have to ask that evolutionary guy, well, how did that thing get buried one centimeter at a time over hundreds and thousands or millions of years. I don't think that would happen. You know, in the world we look at today, something lays on top of the ground for very long, things come and they pull it apart and they eat the meat off of it and scatter the bones. It's not found intact. You can't go out in the forest, you know, and see an intact elk skeleton. It's all, all over the place from the animals that have uh, eaten off of it and so forth. So really the best explanation is that it got buried rapidly by water because it's sedimentary rock. And once again, we have a good explanation for that from our creationist worldview. So let's use Bible, the Bible to explain dinosaurs. What do we find in the Bible? Well, first of all, what we don't find is the word di dinosaurs, not in the King James Version of the Bible. And I haven't seen it in any version of the Bible. Well, why not? You know, there's some actually some Christians who say that all the dinosaur fossils are, were planted there by Satan to test our faith. All they had to do is research the origin of the word dinosaur. They would have seen that it couldn't be in the 1611 Bible because it wasn't invented until 1841. Okay? So it makes sense that for, you know, those 230 years, it couldn't have been in the Bible. It wasn't even invented yet. So there might be some other words that represent dinosaurs. We'll look at that in a minute. It's interesting that in the 1828 dictionary, computer, locomotive, and rocket were in there, but dinosaurs not. It wasn't invented yet. So the dinosaurs were formed on day six of creation, where the great beasts of the earth were created. Are dinosaurs great beasts of the earth? Yeah, I think they would qualify for that. So man was also created on day six. So according to the Bible, man and dinosaurs would have been on the earth at the same time. So we want to look for evidence of them existing on the earth at the same time. So T-Rex is a land animal. Land animals and man were created on day six, so T-Rex was created on day six. But remember, in Genesis 1.30, everything was giving plant and vegetative matter to eat, and there was no meat eating going on in, before Adam and Eve fell. So there's no danger of the T-Rex eating Adam and Eve. So one of the first things you see when you go in the Creation Museum is these kids playing, and there's velociraptors sitting over there. Well, Jurassic Park made velociraptors these uh, horribly aggressive things that like to eat people. And here they are playing with them. So the evolutionists are mad before they even get out of the lobby. But hopefully... <laughs> Hopefully they continue on to see the, the other things that are presented. Um, so the T-Rex ate what God provided for them, just like everything else did. And everything was very good, and as long as Adam didn't get underfoot of one of those big animals, everything was okay. And I suppose if he would have gotten underfoot, gotten underfoot because everything was still perfect, God would have just fixed him up and said, okay, Adam, be more careful next time. So they were formed on day six, and then when Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit, it, it uh, affected all of creation. It tells us about that in Romans. It says that all of creation is subject to the curse and, and is in futility right now. It's groaning and travailing, waiting for the restoration. And so now we got carnivory going on, and we, and we got 
sin is entering the human population and things are getting so evil that God said there's only evil continually from all these people so I must judge that so he, I he judged it with a worldwide flood well that affected everything on earth the only survivors of the worldwide flood were on the ark all the uh, of the land animals the air breathing animals okay with the lungs and humans and so he you know he had everything that lives on the land Saved some of the fish, of course, they survived because they, they were in their element. And they didn't get covered by sediments. But um, at any rate, the flood came, and what wasn't on the ark perished. Well, unfortunately, we, we depict Noah's ark like that in all of our children's books. All those happy faces looking at billions of things floating around dead in the water. That wave's about ready to knock them over, by the way, right? Isn't that boat just real seaworthy there we, we really don't want our kids to have that idea in their head because if like they were like me my parents go into quit going to church when I was in fifth grade they get stuck with that idea in their head they probably never learn better so when somebody says well how'd they get the dinosaurs on the ark they go well yeah they couldn't have done that wow the bible's not true they couldn't have got those on the ark or they watch the history channel oh that's a treat <laughs> the history channel's uh, depiction of Noah's Ark. I decided one time I'm going to watch it until I can't anymore. <laughs> and I watched it for maybe five minutes as it was already raining and Noah was not on the ark. He was chasing down animals to drag them on the ark. So the History Channel forgot to read the biblical account of Noah's Ark so that they could accurately depict it. And uh, so Boy, we got all these things out there that'll deceive you and lead you to thinking the Bible's just, whoa, that can't be true. But when we, thank goodness, we have ministries that want to accurately represent that this is the size of the ark with the royal cubit. It's in Kentucky. It's only 40 miles, 40 minutes by freeway from the Creation Museum. And it's uh, big, <laughs> real big. And it's, there's three different levels in there just like the bible says and there's several reasons why we believe there's no problem getting the dinosaurs on there so you go inside and they show the dinosaurs actually in this particular exhibit the boys in the cage and the dinosaurs are walking by and looking at him <laughs> not really but that's what it kind of looks like huh <laughs> and uh, the dinosaurs aren't exactly like anything we we depict today but they did that on purpose because we know that animals do change over time they just don't change from dinosaurs to birds the dinosaurs will always be dinosaurs they'll have little variations in their appearance and so forth we see that happening we know that's real we don't argue with that so they're going to change over time into what we see, see later you know that the way that we depict them now so they did that on purpose and they showed how they stored the water and they showed how they stored the food. And it's huge, it's humongous, it's big, it's no problem. And don't forget that not all the dinosaurs are huge. The average size is not that big, a cow. So there's the velociraptors. They're long from head to tail, but they're not big. They're just thigh height. And there's Heterodontosaurus, same thing. And this is a medium-sized one or an average-sized one. Uh, Bob and Debbie, when they went on their trip, uh, by the way, if you ever go to the Creation Museum and uh, talk to Gene Anna and myself, because we are lifetime members there and we have free passes that we can give to anybody that we know that's going there. So we gave them our passes. They went to the Creation Museum and he sent me a video clip of this dinosaur, which is animatronic. And it kind of turns around, looks at you and goes, <sighs> like, you're my lunch. <laughs> Pretty cool. There's another average size one. They're up on a, you know, they're not on ground level. That's why they're up so high. Some people say, well, they took dinosaur eggs on the ark. And that's how they got the dinosaurs on the ark. But the Bible says all the animals came to the ark two by two, came to the ark. And I haven't seen any eggs that could go to the ark yet. Okay. So they came. And so the eggs weren't taken on board. They took real live living animals. Because things can, what if you drop the egg? Oh, no. Uh, you know, so they have real-life living animals, but there were some big dinosaurs. We know that. 
T-Rex footprint, about three feet long. <clears throat> T-Rex tooth, about 18 inches long. T-Rex, big. Except I think I could beat him in arm wrestling. Uh, but he could swallow me in one swallow, so I wouldn't get close enough to do it, but anyway. Um, so the answer to the big dinosaur question, here's one possible thing. How could Noah have possibly fit dinosaurs in the ark? How was it possible for your mother to give birth to you? <laughs> Even the largest full-grown creatures were once small, so we think, and then as you go through the ark, you'll see this depicted that they took... Uh, juveniles, so when they got off the ark, they would have a longer reproductive life. On the ark, they would eat less food than the full-grown dinosaur. They, they would produce less waste than the full-grown dinosaur. So there's lots of reasons to believe that they would just take the juvenile-aged dinosaurs. And not all of them were huge, right? So uh, when I put the slide on here, they thought there was 50 dinosaur kinds. It's up to about 70 now. That's 140 dinosaurs. You saw the size of the ark. Should there be any problem with it? No, I don't think so. And here's the dinosaur family tree. And the dinosaur family tree has gray and gold depicted. The gray is hypothetical. The gold is actually observa observations out of the fossil record. So through all these different geologic time periods, crocodilians, we see them always. But Hypothetically, they came from the ancestral archosaurs, even though the branch over there is also gray, so we've never seen that. So they just show up in the fossil record, and we're supposed to believe they came from something because in order for evolution to be true, that had to happen, but we have never seen what they came from for any of these things. The gray part is things that, stuff that's missing. So all the vertical things that go straight up, we see through all these geological layers and they stay the same. We can recognize them as that kind of animal. But you're just not being real if you don't believe that evolution happens, even though the observational evidence tells us no, it doesn't. So all the dinosaurs that weren't on the ark, they perished in the flood like every other living thing that was on the land. They got their T-shirt. They got off the, oh, I survived the flood. Uh, bad news though the types of plants they had to eat changed also there, there probably wasn't a great abundance right after they got off the ark but there also weren't a lot of dinosaurs at first so uh, probably uh, the, just the different food supply I mean they, they have you ever tried to live for a week off of cotton candy <laughs> no you won't live uh, you can eat as much as you want and you'll just blow it up and die because there's no nutritional value because they couldn't maybe digest the new food. The new uh, that went from the pine-type trees before the flood was the majority of the vegetation to the deciduous trees after the flood. And if they couldn't adjust you know, or adapt to that, then they, they might have died, become extinct. We, we do have the asteroid theory, which could have possibly happened, or it could have been volcanoes during the flood. But we do know that all over the earth there's a geological layer that has iridium in it and something big happened and that could have helped the dinosaurs to become extinct because it, we think it caused an ice age. And the dinosaurs weren't very adaptable. Uh, some of the biggest dinosaurs have walnut-sized brains, so they're not real smart creatures, apparently. And so there was an ice age and I, in uh, in other times, I, I, I give a, this guy's view of the Ice Age. This is the best one I've ever found. If you, if you want to know more about the Ice Age, I put his name there. Go to Answers in Genesis or Institute of Creation Research. The sites, uh, did I tell you guys this paper's in the back when you go out? I don't think I said that. It's in the back as you go out. Get it, okay? And it's got these websites on there, and you go there and you type in Michael Ord's view of the Ice Age. And he, he accounts for all the migration of the people into North America and everything through, through his view. It's the best one I've ever read. There's like over, about 200, I think, the last I heard, views uh, from the evolutionary perspective of the Ice Age, different explanations. And the creationists have a bunch of them too. His is the best one I've ever read. That, that's the most 
likely in my estimation. It happened in the past. So some things, all you can do is know there was an ice age Egypt shoved all these rocks, carved all these valleys. We know it happened, but uh, to explain it is hard because it happened in the unobserved past. So over time, the dinosaurs faded from memory. You know, they, like I said, they weren't the most adaptable thing, so they faded from memory, and they eventually, uh, some people think, all became extinct. But we have a record of them going a lot further in history than most people know. This is from Europe. This is, I, I believe, in the 1400s or 1500s. Sir George sent all the history books over there where he's, he took care of the last dragon so that the king's daughter wouldn't have to be sacrificed to him. And, and the answer in Genesis says he didn't kill it, he captured it, and it lived with them for a while, but for all, you know, they had sacrificed many young maidens over history to this, what they called the last dinosaur dragon. So they got many different depictions of that. They all have certain similarities. They kind of look the same. And then we have a lot of other things from different cultures. This is the flag of Wales. A little artistic expression in there, but kind of the same thing. A Viking ship. Now, everybody knows that Christians, we don't do the zodiac stuff. But China has the Chinese zodiac. And it's interesting to look at that and say, well, there's 11 real animals on there. So why would they throw a fake one on there? See the dragon? So they have a year of the dragon. Was that a fake animal? They decided to have a year for it? No. I think they actually thought that dragons were there living with them. And we have evidence that they did, as I'll show you coming up. So Leviathan is in the Bible in chapter 41. Out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. Oh, no. To believe in the literal view of the Bible, i got to believe that there's an animal that can breathe out fire. Oh, no. I've never seen that happen. Well, I actually thank God that he created the bombardier beetle to show us that a one to two inch beetle can breathe out fire, but it's not breathing. It's coming out the other side, end of it. And uh, <laughs> it's got two chambers with chemicals in them that are useless except for making this explosion. And right at the back part of it, it's got another chamber that's got a, a catalyst in it that just as that chemical, those chemicals go out the back of the bombardier beetle, it adds the catalyst and it goes pop like a snap cap. It looks like a little miniature explosion in slow motion. A one to two inch beetle does that, okay? So, uh, I mean, and, and thank goodness that it had evolved so that it happened outside the body because if it explodes inside the body, it's enough to blow it to smithereens. <laughs> so how did these three different chemicals get together and get secreted at just the right ratio and the right time and it happens outside the body? How does that evolve? Because once you blow up the only bombardier beetle you have, that's it. No more bombardier beetles. So I think it was created this way. See, it's just powerful evidence for an uh, intelligent creator God. And that he could definitely, if he can make this little thing do this, he can definitely make a dragon, a, a leviathan. He can aim that. <laughs> uh, there's video clips of this. It's just amazing. And you can probably access them by putting Bombardier Beetle on the search engine for the websites, especially Answers in Genesis back there. So there's also in chapter 40 of Job, we got something called behemoth. And it says he has these real strong body and real big tail. But then if you look in the Schofield Reference Bible and even Matthew Henry's commentary, which I've always loved Matthew Henry's commentary, it says that behemoth is probably a hippopotamus or an elephant. Well, that's because of when they wrote. We didn't know about dinosaurs when they were writing these things. So that's the biggest animals they knew about. They didn't have any other choice but to say it could have been these things. All right? But it talks about this 
tail like a cedar. Well, in the Bible, especially the cedars of Lebanon, are huge trees valued for their lumber, for the being the best lumber available to build really big, beautiful buildings. So they're big, huge trees. And so now let's look at that humongous elephant tail. God's got a sense of humor. <laughs> uh, what about the hippopotamus? <laughs> yeah, really, look at that cedar tree. Okay, well, anyway, it's good to know that we now know that those were probably dinosaurs. So in the scripture, we also read the young lion and the dragon, shalt thou trample underfoot? Sounds like it was a real animal, huh? And he shall slay the dragon that's in the sea. Oh, that sounds like Leviathan. Swallow me up like a dragon. That sounds like something big and fearsome. So it's in the scripture. Now be careful with dragon because it can be Satan, especially in Revelation. Always look at context. So eventually in the 1800s forward, we start finding these fossils all over the world. And now we got printing presses and books and we're starting to get like, you know, different means of communication to get that word around that we're, we're finding them all over the world in the sedimentary layers, especially. And so we dig them up, we make them into these uh, representations. And this one is not, <clears throat> a lot of these are not the actual fossils because they're too delicate. You know, if you stood it up like this, it might just crumble in half. So they, they take the, the fossil, they make casts of it, and then they sell these to the museums and stuff. But this one I have on here because if you look at its head, those things that looks like a horn, they have two chambers, two big chambers, and then a big nasal cavity. So it, it's kind of got the same structure at the front end that the bombardier beetle had at the back end. And so it, it's a candidate for it could have been a fire-breathing dragon or leviathan. And, and so we didn't see it. We can't say it was, but we'd see that that there were animals that had that type of anatomy that they could have been it. So we also have these other things, triceratops. People love triceratops. And of course, we got the T-Rexes. And we put the skin on them because we found the fossils and the mummified skin, so we kind of know what it looks like. So we make these models. And there's a pteranodon. And then we make a model of a pteranodon. And then we go into a cave in Utah and we see something that looks a whole lot like a pteranodon. Wow. The ancient cultures in Utah, the Native Americans, said that they saw these up until the late 1800s. South America, there's people that say, yeah, we, we see them, but we've never been able to get video proof of that or anything. So in the in the Creation Museum, we have this uh, part of it that talks about evidence of the Bible's account of dinosaur history. And so here's this pottery. Uh, I think I can recognize that as a T-Rex. This is from the 14 or 1500s. And they're kind of the same time as Sir George taking care of the dragon. It's kind of interesting how all that kind of lines up that up until that time, we we probably had dragons around is what it look kind of looks like, but anyway I don't know if this is folklore you know this guy here guy went out to take care of T Rex and they got in a big battle you know or not but the thing is that's an accurately look pretty accurate T Rex right there, I think they saw it. Here's a long necked dinosaur they usually eat plants, but he's got a human, so once again the human was probably hunting the dinosaur for food because they make a lot of meat. And so the dinosaur took exception, and anyway, so we got this, but that's an accurate depiction of a long neck dinosaur. The markings on the skin, kind of unusual, but I, I have found a site that said that they have actually found fossilized skin that has those markings on it. And here's, here's the real hero. He's taken on two of them guys at one time. So it may be folklore, like I said, but the dinosaurs are, ac are very accurately depicted there's a triceratops long neck t-rex stegosaurus all on one piece of pottery from the ica culture precursor to the inca culture of south america so this was another one i believe from the aztec uh, people leading up to them 
and they have pottery that has uh, depictions of dinosaurs on it. Looks like they actually saw dinosaurs. And we're back to Sir George again. Kind of, you see a lot of similarities between these dinosaurs from hugely different areas of the earth from times when they didn't have any communication. This is from China, the year of the dragon. So that's a, you know, that dragon head is uh, one that we typically see in some of the dinosaurs have heads like that. And so this one is 2,000 years old. Okay, now I haven't checked out this website, but that's S and it's got an A-I-N-T.com. That's Saint, right? Dot com. But this is uh, 2,000 years old. It's got the correct posture, the dermal spines, the forearms, ends in three-fingered hands. It looks like a therizinosaur 2,000 years ago. They must have seen it. This is uh, in a village that they dug out of the rainforest in Thailand, and there's a stegosaurus depicted. This is in Egypt. Looks like they're hunting a dinosaur. Maybe it was a danger to the village. Maybe they were hungry, but they're hunting the dinosaur. Southwest United States. Looks like we got a couple long-necked dinosaurs out there on the prairie. But I don't blame them because really, when you get down to it, uh, dinosaurs pretty tasty stuff right there. <laughs> Matter of fact, if you batter it and you put it in some hot oil and you cook it up, fry it up, it tastes just like yeah. frog legs. <laughs> <laughs> it's Photoshop, of course. Okay. But I love those things. <laughs> well... We got lots of evidence that the Chinese domesticated some of the dinosaurs. Marco Polo even depicted it in his little notebook that he kept. He drew a sketch of these two dinosaur-like animals drawing the emperor of China in his cart. We got brass carvings of long-necked dinosaurs on the tomb of Bishop Bell in the 15th century, the 1400s again. And that's still there, covered up by a rug because they don't want people to see it. Don't want to sit anybody thinking that there's dinosaurs in the 1500s, do we, or 1400s? So Richard Owens, who made up the word dinosaur, which means terrible lizard, by the way, uh, this was his first depiction of an iguanodon. Later on, we found uh, better evidence that made it a little more accurate. And then eventually we figured out that the reason we see sometimes it's two legs, sometimes four legs that they're walking on is that they started off walking on two legs until they got too heavy, and then they would drop down to four legs. And so we knew that we know now think that that's the way they were. And here's another uh, little statuette from around the time of Christ that accurately depicts the iguanodon because we think that they saw them. Once again, it looks like you know humans might have used the anim these animals for their purposes. Dinosaurs in the Bible.com is another place to go if you want to see explanations for all these where they are found. They found a lot of them like this in uh, near Mexico City, and they're fr from around the time of Christ, which is pretty interesting. So uh, now we got cave drawings in Utah. And this one's in Arizona, in the Havasupai Reservation. And this one's up by Lake Champlain. Is that right? No, Superior. And I had this one off for a while because I'd never seen a dinosaur that looked like that. And then when I was going through these sites, preparing for this message, there were dinosaurs that looked like that, but their horns weren't quite that shape. They were kind of like this, so... There could be, you know, their cousins had horns that were a little bit different shape. But so after all this, here's my conclusion. Many cultures from all over the earth accurately show dinosaurs in their art and pottery long before dinosaur fossils were identified and the modern day models were formed. 
it appears that these people lived with dinosaurs. That's what I think. They had to have seen them. Because we got all over the world. If they were making it up, it wouldn't be the same from this culture to that culture way over there. So if you just logically think about it, it appears they had to, they had to live with it. Well, should we believe that dinosaurs are millions of years old from the fossil record? <clears throat> Stunning bow to evolution's age-old story about dinosaurs is that we found this, stretchable connective tissue in a 65 million year old T-Rex bone, supposedly 65 million years from the layer that it was in, and you can take tweezers and stretch it and it snaps back, okay? The muscle part of it looks like it just came out of the butcher shop, you know? 65 million years old, what do the evolutionists say? Well, we don't know how that happened yet, but we know it did because there it is, and uh, you know it has to be millions of years old because that sedimentary layer. Uh, I also, I, I have on, on the Calvary Chapel website, through the years, I've done my many different talks, and one of them is 10 reasons to doubt radiometric dating, which shows how shaky and faulty that whole thing is, and the illusion of human evolution, and other things which also back up the fact that this is recent material. Those are actual red blood cells. The lady who found that got ostracized by the whole scientific community. And they tried for years to get her to say those were bacteria, and she did all, ran all the tests to prove that they were actually red blood cells. And uh, so she, they're believed to be actual red blood cells. And back then when she found it, that was, that was a surprising find. But now we're looking for it, and we find it just about every year. We find more of it now. The actual red blood cells, stretchable, connective tissue and stuff like that in, inside of dinosaur bones. So this is the foot of a real dinosaur. It belongs to a megalopteryx, and its skin is considered the best preserved dinosaur tissue to date. So that, that's kind of mummified too. If you, if you, we do know that you will be preserved longer if you're a, in a dry, cool climate, like a cave or something. You'll be preserved longer, but I don't think 65 million years is in the realm of possibility. So th this is something I put in here because I just want you to see the prejudice against the creationist worldview, okay? In 1994, the winners of the race to sequence dinosaur DNA were Scott Woodward and his colleagues. They published their results in the journal Science. They extracted DNA from a purportedly well-preserved dinosaur bone. Why did they say purportedly? If you can get DNA and sequence it, isn't it really well-preserved? I mean, you got the facts to show it. Why is it not accepted? So anyway, they were not rewarded for their victory. Why not? Well, the sequence they discovered was not like birds or reptiles. Remember, dinosaurs to birds. But it seemed unique, like it was its own created kind, maybe. Since this 1994 DNA did not fit the evolutionary interpretive filter, they were raked over the academic coals. No scientist has attempted to publish any dinosaur DNA research since. That's, this was written 15 years after that. So you go outside the boundaries of what the evolutionists want you to say, and they come down on you big time. It's suppressed. Anything that agrees with the creationist worldview is suppressed in the evolutionary community. They don't want science to lead you anywhere but to them. So dino sightings. There's this thing called Michele Mbembe, and it seems to be the most credible possibility for an actual living dinosaur in today's world because Missionaries have come out of this big uh, swamp in Kenya and Uganda that's about as big as the state of Mississippi. And they said they've seen these long-necked dinosaurs. But, so creationist groups have sent in teams, but we've never been able to photograph them or anything. We just got some weird sounds from creatures in the swamp. So until there's credible evidence, I'd say it's like Bigfoot. You know, it's a legend of the area. But... There is one piece of evidence that shows that this could be true. If you take a book to these people, and they all have, Michele Mbembe is the main name, but around that swamp, there's enough different 
language is spoken, that they don't all call it the same thing. So if you take a dinosaur book, you know, depicting dinosaurs, and you say, have you ever seen one of these? And all the people all the way around that swamp will point to the same one, which is, you know, not real observable, observable scientific evidence, but it's circumstantial evidence that there must be something out there. But why can't we find it to photograph it? So a missionary who gave his phone number, if you wanted to ask him about it, <laughs> watched this animal for 15 minutes in Kenya in that swamp I was just talking about. And in the Uganda, I mean, excuse me, <laughs> South America, Diplodocus is confirmed by many of the tribes east of the Ukulele River. So they say that they see that. But we haven't been able to get video evidence. Well, what about these? These are real. We know these exist. Croc monitor, 10 to 12 feet. That's bigger than the average dinosaur. Iguana, up to 6 feet, like an average dinosaur. Komodo dragon, up to 10 feet. They, they eat baby elephants. They're big, and they're called dragons. An alligator, up to 16 feet. Saltwater croc, up to 23 feet. We still got some pretty big, fearsome animals out there. And that's in the Creation Museum. And then I came home, and I went to the Phoenix Zoo, and I took a picture of a Komodo dragon. I'm just like... There just seems something familiar about that. <laughs> oh, well, if you don't need something anymore, then usually you, use, you lose the ability to have that because you don't need it. So you can lose information. We know that you just can't create it to become a new kind, but this could lose information, like lose the information for that to become that. Really, the only difference between those two things is that dinosaurs back in, in uh, the early days had their legs underneath them, the Komodo dragons out to the side. Otherwise, it looks pretty much the same thing. I'd love to see the DNA compared. That's a, called a Gaia. It was in the Phoenix Zoo, but I haven't seen it the last couple of times I've been there. So, Colossians 2.8 says, Beware lest any man cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. That's what my whole thing tomorrow is about, how Satan tries to deceive us through various means. Um, so the basic principles of the world is what we're taught in the school system. The tradition of men is taught in the school system. And they both say you don't need the Bible and you don't need the gospel. You don't need any of that fairy tale stuff. You need to believe me, the scientist. This is what reality is. But hopefully I've shown you enough visual evidence that you'll at least consider the fact that if you've never heard this before, it's worth investigating to see if it's the truth or not. And if you go to those websites and look at that and just, in my estimation, there's way more credible evidence that man lived with dinosaur than just some scientists saying, no, 65 million years ago, they were gone. So that didn't happen. But we see lots of evidence that it they did live together. So, uh, like the scripture I had at the beginning, Jesus said, if you don't believe Moses, why would you believe me? If you can't take Genesis as the truth, why are you going to take the Gospel of John as the truth? Where Jesus is quoted big time. So, here's the challenge. Church, we want to be a light in a dark culture. That's being taught that dinosaurs are millions of years old and never lived with man. So let's use them for missionary lizards. They're easy to talk about. I used to, I only decided to do this about a week ago because I looked on the, on the website and I found out I haven't done this for like seven years in the church, so I know a lot of you have never heard it before. So I decided to do it, but I, did, I usually order these tracks called uh, what really happened to the dinosaurs, and they, it has those five Fs I taught you today, and it has the gospel message in the back. And I've handed out thousands of those <laughs> over the years. Uh, uh, it used to be that I would set up over at the trunk or treat, and I'd hand out candy, but I just put those dinosaur ones out there, and people would go by and they go, whoa, dinosaurs, can I take this? And I'll take three, give some to your friends, you know. <laughs> It was a neat outreach. Uh, 
as time went on and I got older and it got a couple of cold nights that made me not feel too good, I quit doing that. But uh, you can order those from Answers in Genesis and they're awesome witnessing tools. And this guy says the creation ministry is exciting. I've seen dinosaur tracks, T-R-A-C-T-S, used to lead people to Christ. And that's exactly what those were designed to do. So here's the challenge today from this teaching. For the church, believers in Jesus Christ, we've been influenced by the culture to believe things that are unbiblical. If you find out that's where you're at today, today's the day that you can say, no longer, Lord, I believe your word, not man's word. If you've never heard this before, if you've never really trusted in the Bible at all, even for your salvation, hopefully you can recognize the Bible holds the truth. Over and over again, it says it's the truth. It's the word from God telling us that's the truth. That's what you need to believe for eternal life. You can find eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. How do I know that? Because the Bible tells me so. If I doubt the Bible, I've got no basis for my salvation. It's a very important thing. It doesn't seem like creation science should be that really important. Who cares? I believe in Jesus. Well, why? Is the word that tells you about Jesus, is it true or not? Can you prove it's true? We're supposed to. We're supposed to be able to do that. So hopefully I've given you a little ammunition for that today and that we can use it with our grandchildren, nephews and nieces, our peers. We can just kind of gently nudge them to check this out. Let's pray. My Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this group of people who have come in and uh, maybe they weren't expecting a message like this, but I hope it was a blessing to them. Help us to go out of this place and, and carry your message to our culture. The Bible holds the word of truth, not man, not science, not scientists. They are men and they can make errors, but your word is true. Help us to believe that and act upon it. <laughs> I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Anybody wants to talk about this or you want prayer or anything, come on up. But otherwise, you're dismissed and thank for coming.